Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome once again to the Physics Colloquium. It is an absolute pleasure today to have our speaker, Professor Benjamin Lev, join us today from Stanford University. Benjamin Lev is a professor of physics and applied physics at Stanford. He received his bachelor's degree uh, very good, well, uh, magna cum laude. This is mentioned here from Princeton, so very good. And then his PhD from Caltech, both in physics. Then he was a National Research Council postdoc at Jilla and an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He joined the Stanford faculty in 2011, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Applied Physics. He's received numerous awards. We will, so that to give you time for your colloquium, we will read only a few of them. So they include a Packard Foundation Fellowship, a PCASE Award from President Obama, an NSF Early Career Award, Early Career Awards from the Air Force DARPA, ONR, and other federal agencies. And Benjamin's research at the moment focuses on exploring quantum many-body physics, including quantum neural networks, using techniques at the interface of ultra-cold atomic physics, quantum optics, and condensed matter physics. He is an APS fellow and a member of the Defense Science Study Group. It is a pleasure to have Professor Lev with us today. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, I, I love to come to Berkeley. It's uh, refreshing to come across the bay um, and to see all of you. Uh, there's a lot of you. I don't see actually all that well, so if you have a question, uh, like wave your hands around so I'll notice you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna tell you about one of the three projects that we have at Stanford in my group. Um, and this one is about making a spin glass out of atoms and photons. So I'll explain what that means. Uh, the folks that do the real work are here uh, highlighted. Uh, Ronan Crozy, who just uh, left for a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute, Brendan Marsh, David Archer Schuler, and uh, Henry Hunt. And we're very fortunate to have two awesome theory collaborators. Uh, one is uh, Jonathan Keeling at St. Andrews uh, in Scotland, and Sarin Gopal Krishnan in Princeton. Okay, so let's begin. All right, so this, the glass mystery. So what is, uh, what's a spin glass? What's a glass? Like, why is this interesting? Well, if we just back up and think about glasses, these, these things that are uh, working pretty well for me, but not awesome, um, they, uh, you know, they are still sort of my mysterious. They're an everyday object, and yet we don't know everything we would like to know about them. And that's uh, kind of surprising, because you, know, you generally think that we know everything about our everyday world, and that's not true. Um, so uh, Phil Anderson famous uh, condensed matter theorist, uh, back in 95, remarked that, at least in his view, that the deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory is probably the theory of the nature of the glass and the glass transition. That's a pretty bold statement. And this is from somebody, if, if you know Phil Anderson, you know, is a you know, big, uh, strong theorist in uh, theory of cuprates, you know, high temperature superconductivity, but yet the glass is something that really provokes him. So why is there a mystery associated with the glass? Uh, well, it's because somehow there's an emergence of rigidity or, or order um, via disorder and frustration, so two ingredients, that happens without any obvious symmetry breaking. So what do I mean by that? Like, if we look microscopically at uh, a glass, a structural glass, like what I have in, on my face, um, and a crystal, uh, well, we notice something different about the two. Like, one, the crystal is, is very regular. It's ordered, okay? Um, that order uh, arises from a, a symmetry breaking, translational symmetry breaking, and the result is some rigidity of the system. Uh, if you squeeze it, it responds and snaps back to where it was. Um, the glass has a similar thing, like you know, if you poke it, it'll, it, won't, it doesn't cave in on itself. Um, but there's no obvious kind of structure here. I mean, you know, repeatable structure. It's just kind of random. Um, and so, there we go. Um, and so, you know, but what's weird about this is that, like, you know, at some higher temperature, it looks like a liquid. In case, in, in indeed, this looks like a liquid. If I just took, took a, a snapshot in time of a liquid, it would look like this. I wouldn't know that it's rigid. Um, and certainly, a liquid does not look like this. Um, but despite the fact that it kind of microscopically looks like a liquid and can sometimes behave like that, if you cool it down enough, it's brittle and it behaves kind of like a solid. You can crack it. Um, so that we don't really understand how that works. It's hard to write down a Hamiltonian for this because you'd have to write, enumerate all the different uh, microscopic positions and keep track of all of that. So it's really hard to do statistical mechanics on this thing. 
So um, folks, you know, for many, many, many decades, half a century, have been thinking about, you know, is there a simpler system to study that can teach us about these underlying principles of the emergence of rigidity and order uh, from disorder and frustration without symmetry breaking, or at least obvious symmetry breaking? And the, the answer is yes. There is a, a simpler system to study that has a lot of these ingredients that we can start to try to build intuition from. Um, and it's, a, it's called a frustrated magnet. All right, so these are simpler systems, but they're really far from simple, and I hope that will be conveyed through the course of my talk. Um, they're everyday materials, so you know, if you grab some copper and dope it with a, a, dope it with a, a magnet, then you, uh, this, you can turn this magnetic alloy into uh, what's called a spin glass. A spin glassy system. Those are everyday materials. Um, some non-everyday materials, maybe here at, at Berkeley in the department, they're everyday, but uh, generally speaking, they're not everyday materials. Um, also have some spin glass regimes. They're generally not uh, remarked upon because there's some more fascinating uh, other types of um, phases that occur in these phase diagrams. But they exist, and generally because you know systems are disordered, and if they're magnetic, then they can be glassy. What's your uh, Doping. Okay, it doesn't really matter so much. Okay, so um, okay, so what are these ingredients that are uh, kind of um, uh, important for glassiness in general? Um, so one is frustration, as I said, um, and in a spin system, generally we talk about geometrical frustration, um, and that can be illustrated by this uh, simple uh, triangular plaquette, where let's say we have spins that are either up or down. We call those Ising spins, but there's spins that can be either up or down. And those spins can interact um, in such a way that they say prefer to be aligned. So we call that a ferromagnetic interaction. I'll draw, draw that in blue with this plus sign. Um, or let's say that you know, one bond is anti-ferromagnetic in the sense that those spins want to be anti-aligned to each other. So if I start up here and say uh, denote this one spin up, then it's easy to, to say, okay, well then let's make this one spin up also. But then I'm kind of confused because I don't know what to do with this uh, third leg of the triangle. Um, it could be up or down, and either way, I'm not going to satisfy everybody. Um, so what happens is that you get two degenerate states. Um, if I have many plaquettes, I get an exponential kind of uh, propagation of these degenerate states. And that is geometrical frustration in an icing system that uh, gives you a lot of the richness that I'll talk about. So um, an example of, of increasing this kind of plaquette is an all-to-all -all graph. So this is a, a graph of a spin network. So each little dot here is a, is a point where a spin could be up or down, let's say. Um, and then these linkages are all the different possible linkages that could possibly occur in what's called an all tall graph. And, and I've colored some of them blue and some of them uh, orange because some of them are, are going to be ferromagnet, some are antiferromagnet. If I choose that randomly, then this is a glassy system, OK? So, um, What's nice about this versus the structural glass is that it is actually possible to write down a Hamiltonian for this. Um, uh, Edwards and, uh, Hamil and Anderson, uh, Phil, the same Phil Anderson, did this uh, in the 70s, early 70s. And, uh, and it looks kind of like this. It's an icing model um, where you have uh, the product of two poly operators, um, say along Z, for spin I and spin J. And there's some coupling matrix, uh, JIJ. That's the, this kind of these lines with different colors. And if I make that random, if I make this coupling randomly positive or negative um, between spin I and spin J, then this describes a glassy system, a spin glassy system. Uh, so another, you know, kind of the manifestation of glassiness or the, the kind of, uh, you know, microscopically is this rugged free energy landscape. So if I calculate, if I plug in uh, the spin configurations, like whether this is up or down or down or up or whatever I want to do on this x-axis and calculate the energy from this Hamiltonian, I get something that looks, you know, like a, it looks like the Alps. It doesn't look like the Midwest, you know, pretty flat. Um, it looks like you're sitting in Switzerland, okay? So you get these mountains and you get these deep valleys. And if you just flip one spin, you can go all the way to a very different valley, okay? So there's no, there aren't very deep kind of basins of what are called basins of attraction or, or, or valleys that are broad or anything like that. It's not like the Central Valley of California that occupies like half a state or something. Um, they're very, very narrow. And so, um, and so if you get stuck in one of these, so if you cool this thing down and you're stuck in, in one of these valleys here, which you can't even even see very well, um, it's really, really hard to jump to one of these other valleys. Like you'd have to actually, 
you know, you have to work really hard and flipping just the right spins to get to some other valley. And so what ends up happening when the system size gets big is that um, each one of these valleys kind of becomes like its own thermodynamic system. In fact, you know, you can kind of think about each one of these valleys as its own thermodynamic state. And so instead of like a ferromagnet having two thermodynamic states, all the spins up and all the spins down, in a spin glass, you have an extensive number of thermodynamic states. And that's the origin of the complexity that comes in with the spin glass. Okay, so there are many different versions of this. This is just like a very simple version, an icing model, uh, you know, no you know, constraints on what JIJ is. Uh, but you can have ones that are XY, you know, where this is uh, XX and YY and stuff like that. Um, you could, those are called vector spin glasses. Uh, the case in which this JIJ is all to all like this, which I didn't assume here, this could be just like nearest neighbors. Uh, but the all to all case is called the Sherrington Kirkpatrick version of the model. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the model that was, you know, the first spin glass model that was rigorously solved. Okay, so uh, who solved that? Uh, well, I get uh, the person who solved that is Giorgio Parisi. Um, and just like yeah, two years ago, he won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, so it wasn't actually couched as like a spin glass Nobel Prize. This might be why some of you are scratching your heads, but that's actually what it was. Um, they talked a lot about the other two winners were for climate change, and they kind of bundled him into that for climate change. Uh, but really, it was for solving the, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass. So it was a big deal. Um, so going back to Phil Anderson in that uh, 95, some of his you know, statements, he also made it another interesting one, which is that the solution of the problem of the infinite range Sherry Kirkpatrick spin glass, which Parisi did in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, is, uh, you know, uh, has brought in implications for many, many, many fields, um, like neural networks, computer algorithms, evolution, computational complexity, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, if you open up a book about like modeling brain functionality with math, with statistical mechanics, <laughs> the whole book is filled with IC models, disordered IC models. That is the, the language that you use to model things like associative memory. Um, it's also, you know, if you can write down machine learning, all those layers and stuff like that, that you can write down as spin glass models. Um, and so, you know, and then because these things are what are called NP complete problems, um, they relate to, uh, the spin glass relates to all these other types of uh, applications, like some esoteric ones, like max cut, cutting a graph, um, optimally traveling salesman problem, um, you know, some you know, esoteric uh, chess problems, protein folding, so a lot of science problems. You can see here the, the direct physical relationship. This is also a corrugated alpine like, like um, free energy structure. Uh, but other, you know, um, any other kind of these graph coloring or class scheduling problems. So um, it's a big deal to, to learn about spin glasses. They relate to a lot of things. Um, but how do we learn about them? Uh, so, you know, uh, if, you know, as a condensed matter, uh, you know, if you're a condensed matter experimentalist, you know, you would go and you put one of these things in a magnet, you would cycle the magnet up and down, change the temperature and so forth. That's great, but at some point, it, that, you know, you run out of things to do. You find a lot of interesting phenomena like aging and hysteresis and so forth, but it doesn't tell you about this microscopic landscape, which really kind of fingerprints what's going what's going on in the system. And so, uh, and the reason is that, you know, there's not really a lot of great ways to microscopically observe the spin states in kind of tangible materials. So what I'm gonna tell you today is our attempt to address this by um, kind of leveraging a lot of the, the new technology in atom and, and photon manipulation that has gone on in the AMO world. And try to look, look at spin glassy versions of those because we can have microscopic control of them. So I'm um, going to jump into now our particular version of this, uh, which is kind of weird. And so, you know, give me, give me a few moments to explain our physical system. It's a bit unusual. Uh, what we use and what we've been developing over the last 10 years or so is something called confocal cavity QED. So cavity QED is a, the physical system where uh, light and matter strongly interact, at least the interesting, uh, many of the interesting regimes of cavity QED. Uh, we use a particular version of this that takes this cavity and creates it in such a way that the radius of curvature of the mirrors are exactly equal to the length between them, this fabry perot resonator. That's called a confocal cavity. Um, and what we do, and I'm just gonna walk you through various parts of this uh, cartoon, um, is to uh, place atoms, in little clumps of atoms, inside the cavity in, in different regions. Those are these green little blobs. Those we use optical dipole traps or tweezers, if you will. And uh, we cool 
these, these little clumps down to uh, TC for Bose condensation. So these you know, are bosons and they form a matter wave. So around that temperature. And we can put, um, right now we're playing around with eight or 10 of these. And we can place them wherever we like in this transverse plane. Um, their spacing can be you know, much larger than the waist of the Gaussian mode, the fundamental mode, TM00 mode, which is 35 microns. We can go out to several hundred microns. And you might say, well, you know, there's not a lot of modes out there. But the confocal cavity is weird. It, it actually resonates at many of those Hermi Gaussian TEM modes at the same frequency. It's what's called a degenerate multimode cavity. And so the light that bounces back and forth is bouncing back and forth in like the TEM51 mode or the TEM25 mode. And if you superimpose all those modes together, uh, like here, okay, so we have. Um, these are the L and M's here. Those are the number of nodes of the waste. So if you superimpose all of these Gaussian, the other Hermite poly polynomials together, you actually form a new basis set uh, for the electromagnetic modes, spatial modes inside the cavity. They're all the same frequency. We call those synthetic mode bases. So these are kind of non-local mode shapes. They kind of go over the entire volume. They extend way out. But if you uh, superimpose a lot of them, you get little spikes of the electromagnetic field. And each one of those spikes can tile like little spots in, say, a rectangular grid all throughout this transverse plane here to form a new mode basis for the cavity. Okay? And so um, what ends up happening is if we scatter light um, with a pump field, say this, this red laser beam here, off these green atoms into the cavity, the, uh, the light that gets scattered from the pump into the cavity will, will scatter into one of these synthetic modes that's, that's concentrated at that very same clump of atoms, that, that node. So that's these little kind of hourglass blue shapes here. Like so each one of these is a different synthetic mode, which is just a, a new basis, uh, a local basis, uh, instead of this non-local Hermit Gauss basis. Okay, so you get these local fields at each one of these uh, clumps of atoms, all right? Um, and if you have enough, if you have a good enough quality mirror on cavity, then instead of this length, intrinsic length scale being around 35 microns, uh, the new modes are less than two microns, okay? So it's pretty, very small. And how do you think about that? Well, it's kind of like the minimum spot that can be resolved by the numerical aperture of these, these mirrors, okay? So these mirrors are kind of like, like a lens system, and they can resolve the spot of atoms down to about two microns. So that light then uh, sca uh, leaves the cavity, can, can leave the cavity, be collected by a mirror, and be directed into uh, a camera, like so, um, that, so that we can see what's going on. Before I tell you exactly what happens there, let me just give you the cavity parameters for the aficionados, so this is for the, the AMO grad students. Um, so uh, our coupling constant, which is the rate in which um, a photon from an atom can be scattered to a cavity mode and then back in a coherent fashion, that uh, happens about 1.5 megahertz. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, the rate in which um, field is emitted uh, from one of these um, mirrors, which is not fully reflective, uh, some of the light can, can uh, go through it, um, that capillary is, is 10 times smaller, it's about 150 kilohertz, so that's good, so we can like, do coherent stuff before dissipation happens. Um, if we take a ratio of these, of this squared divided by this, also divided by uh, another dissipative rate, which is just spontaneous emission of these atoms uh, somewhere else, then we get what's known as the single mode, so just a single mode, uh, let's say like the Gaussian mode, single atom cooperativity, which is about five. And that's respectable, okay? It's respectable, it's good. It's greater than one, which means that we can have coherent dynamics uh, before dissipative dynamics. But uh, that's not the real story. The real story is that actually the cooperativity is a, a factor of 20 or so uh, times greater in this kind of confocal cavity. Because the electromagnetic field at each uh, of these atoms here is increased by the superposition of thousands of modes supported by the cavity. So you get a huge electric field spike, and that gives you what's called a, a multi-mode enhancement, and we get for a single atom a cooperativity of around 110. That's state of the art. That's uh, almost as good or maybe a little bit better than anyone has ever done uh, before with optical cavities. Um, and that happens at each one of these little uh, spots, like so, okay? All right, so um, this cooperativity is great, but in order to do the physics that I'm gonna talk about, we actually need more than one atom. We need the dipole of many atoms in each one of these nodes in order to, to uh, accomplish the uh, spin glass network 
um, dynamics before uh, dissipation sets in. And so we actually put not just one atom, but we put 10 to the 5 atoms in each spot, OK? We believe we can go down to the single atom per spot limit, and we have a paper showing what would happen in terms of entanglement when that, when that occurs. OK, so let's go back to what I was saying earlier, which is uh, now we can read out what's going on inside the cavity. Um, so if we, uh, if we beat the uh, pump field against the emitted cavity field like so, so it's like a local oscillator, we can take a hologram or a spatial heterodynamic. And so the light that comes out comes out in these little spots. That's these little spots here. They have different colors because this uh, interference here allows us to get both the, the amplitude and the phase of the light coming out. And so if we use this kind of clever uh, color map where the, the intensity is the, the amplitude and the, of the color and the uh, color itself, the shade of it, um, is the phase, then we see we get, we've discovered twister mats. <laughs> so, the, the eight clumps inside the cavity come out in different colors. Um, we get a, a mirror image because the confocal cavity actually supports only even or all odd maps. Um, so we're just going to focus on this top part here. So we have eight clumps. Well, here it's just drawn uh, five because it gets hard in, in, uh, in Blender. Uh, but uh, we actually have eight for the data I'll talk to you, talk to you uh, today about. Uh, there's a position from the center, like there. There's R of I. Um, and then you can see the little arrows, which correspond to this angle here. And those are the arrows and spins. So what we're actually going to be dealing with here are not icing spins, where they're just up or down. We're going to be dealing with XY spins. Um, and actually, not actual real spins, uh, but pseudo spins, where the spin is, is actually the, a density wave that forms from the action of the interference of this pump field and the, the light that's generated by the scattering that forms a little ripple on top of each BC uh, here. So these tiny little BCs. It forms a little ripple. And what we're going to call the XY spin is actually just the phase of this density wave. So if I do that, it'll illustrate it. So the spin angle is the phase of this density wave. Cool. So that's just like a pseudo spin mapping. All right? Um, good. So there's one other piece of the puzzle that I didn't tell you about, which is that there's, there's another field that occurs. Um, a confocal cavity, when light goes, scatters from one atom to a mirror and then back again, um, it, not it not only scatters back that, that, that hourglass kind of local spot, but it also takes the Fourier, the path length takes exactly the Fourier transform of this object and, and places it back onto itself. That's what confocal means, okay? So there's, there's two sources of field back at the atoms, the local compact little dot and the Fourier transform of it at the same time. And it's the Fourier transform of it that actually gives us the coupling, Jij, of a photon from this atom to the mirror and back and forth together that realizes either, say, um, a positive. If it's positive, it's like a ferromagnetic coupling. They want to be the same x, y uh, angle. Or uh, anti-ferromagnetic. They want to be the opposite. Okay, And that just depends on the, the phase shift that happens as it propagates back and forth here. OK, so how does this really look? Uh, so if you go into like an optics textbook like Sigmund or something like that, like, um, you'll, you'll get that the, um, that the ray tracing diagram for a confocal cavity looks like this hourglass uh, pattern here. So you see this like dark red line, it's hourglass. So that's good, that's true, it gives you some intuition. Uh, but the real field, if you calculate you know, the field uh, going on here, Maxwell's equations, you get this much more complicated blue and orange um, field pattern behind it. So uh, to kind of talk you through what's going on here, you have the spots that came out. Uh, so that's one of the spots that came out. This is just for a single atom here. That's this uh, horizontal line here. It comes out, and you can image it. Then it comes back again, and then there's a mirror image. That's the mirror image I was telling you about. It's because of the racetrack symmetry. So you get these two spots, even though there's just one clump of atoms in this example. And then if you take the uh, Fourier transform of a spot off center, you get a cosine. And that's this kind of cosine variation here, like so, which is the crosses of this. So the cross is what we call a non-local field. And that's the, the kind of um, up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, cosine or sinusoidal variation uh, overlaid on top of it. We can assign some meaning here uh, in terms of like what this field profile looks like. And actually, it's field, but I could also call this the energy of an interaction. So if I have two atoms within a spot here, they'll interact. Uh, with, this, with a strength uh, proportional to this uh, 
Bessel function, uh, which you know it's exponential kind of kind of profile here, uh, which has a length scale C, which is that two microns for for our cavity. Okay, so this is the local interaction, but then uh, this non-local interaction, this field or actually energy, um, gives you another type of interaction where a photon can can uh, go through this this cross part and back to two different atoms like so, that um, mediates an interaction that is the cosine of the dot product um, with an argument of where the position, the first atom is uh, position i and the second at position rj, normalized by the weights of the cavity squared. So this is weird. Um, this is what gives us that GIJ coupling matrix. I don't think I've seen it in any condensed matter textbook or any kind of interacting physics textbook. Um, it's a very weird kind of Euclidean interaction. Um, but it's really cool. It's really, really useful in the sense that if I just move these atoms around from I, R, I, R, J a little bit, I could change the sign of this interaction because it's a cosine, right? If I change the phase, I go from positive to negative. And in fact, if I start putting atoms in here in random locations, then you can show that you get a random distribution of interaction signs. So that's how we get the randomness, and because it changes sign, how we get the frustration to build a spin glass. Yeah, this is just uh, looking at it. This would be like a camera that's looking at the light coming out in, in X and Y. Okay. And this is each. Yeah, it's emitted like that. Um, so you know, we, we like to kind of jokingly call this a, uh, uh, an active quantum gas microscope. So if you guys have heard uh, talks about the quantum gas microscope, where you use a big lens to look at atoms you know, at the micron scale, cell micron scale. This is kind of active in the sense that you can look at the atoms through this um, this uh, you know, high NA uh, optic here. But then, of course, the light gets fed back onto the atoms to give you interaction. So that's the active part. OK, so you should be asking yourself, why bother? Right? I, I tell my graduate students, always keep asking yourself, why bother doing this? Is this, is this going to teach me something new? Is this going to be a demonstration? What, what is this really going to do? So, uh, so here's my reasons for doing this project. Um, one, uh, no one's created a spin glass with that form of interaction. So that particular variety of spin glass has never been studied before. It has some interesting different statistical properties. Um, second, um, you know, the spin glass or any glass itself is kind of like, in some sense, a non-equilibrium uh, form of matter in the sense that it takes you know, logarithmic time, uh, decades. Uh, it takes a long time uh, to actually settle down into a uh, thermodynamic state. Um, because it has to go through this rugged lands landscape. Um, so it's already often not quite in equilibrium, but now we're actually doing something on top of that. We're kind of dressing that, wrapping that in another kind of source of non-equilibrium non physics, which is the fact that we're driving it through that pump light, and then it's dissipating naturally through light leaking out of the cavity. So it's a driven dissipative system on top of these arrested, very slow dynamics. And that's weird. No one's ever studied, it, as far as I know, a situation like that. Um, second, or sorry, third, um, the interaction range can be tuned. So I'm, I'm going to talk here all about all to all graphs because for us it's easiest to make that. But we can actually clip those graphs so that you know only nearest neighbors or some structure of the graph is uh, is in effect. And it's known. You know, okay, so one of the biggest controversies in StatMech is the the fact that people haven't figured out what the order, what the ground state or order of a spin glass is when it's not all to all, or and when it's actually uh, short range. So a short range spin glass, nobody exactly knows what that order is. So yeah, we can write down the Hamiltonian, which is better than this sort of thing, but we can't solve it. And so you know, there's two groups of uh, researchers, broadly speaking, the Parisi group, who think it has something to do with something I'll talk about soon called replica symmetry breaking. Another group thinks it has something to do with uh, other physics, renormalization group physics, um, like, um, called the drop of model character. People haven't really figured this out, and it's because numerically it's hard to, to study the system over long times. Experimentally, it's hard to get down into the guts. So if we can make a system that's big enough eventually, uh, we might be able to address that question. Um, and then, you know, we have quantum effects in our system. The, we're making this with atoms and photons. And so right now, with a lar large number of uh, atoms per, per node, some of the quantum effects are washed out. But eventually, you can get down to the quantum spin limit and really ask, like, you know, does 
uh, entanglement have anything to do with how the spin glass organized and therefore anything to do with optimization problems that you might embed in the spin glass, like I was telling you earlier about like traveling salesmen and so forth. So that's a fun, fun kind of thing to do. All right, so let's start getting into the weeds. That's the, the first part of my talk. So let's get into the weeds about like how do we actually characterize what we make when we try to make this, this uh, spin glass state using atoms and photons. So uh, spin glasses are, are strange in that they need two order parameters in order to, to fingerprint what they are. Um, so if we take the magnetization, which uh, you know, you're familiar with with ferromagnets and paramagnets, uh, then what you typically do is take all the spins, take their time average, uh, and then a average them together, and you get this quantity called the magnetization. <laughs> and if you plot the magnetization, you can distinguish some of these phases. So this diagram has temperature on the y-axis normalized by, say, strongest coupling constant. Uh, on the x-axis, um, this is kind of weird, but uh, what we're doing on the x-axis is changing the ratio of positive j-coupling um, j to negative j-coupling. So if we're way out here where it's all positive, then we just have the usual paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition. We go from zero magnetization in a paramagnet, because all the spins are averaging to zero, uh, to a frozen uh, direction either up or down with the ferromagnet like so. But if we start to sprinkle in some negative couplings, so we start to get that geometric frustration, then at some point we actually um, create a, a, you know, kind of percolate in a, a different uh, phase um, into this portrait. Um, that's called the spin glass. And unfortunately, in the spin glass, because the atoms are, or, sorry, the spins are in random directions, also have zero magnetization. So how do you distinguish between these two? Well, in order to do that, uh, we need a second order parameter. And this causes a lot of uh, conceptual difficulties and a lot, a lot of problems, uh, but it works. And this is called the, the Q or the spin overlap. And so what it is is basically this squared. So it's this kind of time average squared. Uh, time, it's a time average squared of, of the spin uh, average over all the different spins. And if you take this and then look at this diagram, well, the Q, this overlap is going to be zero for a paramagnet. It's going to be non-zero for a ferromagnet because all of them up and all of them down will give you a non-zero uh, squared thing. Um, but it's also non-zero for the spin glass because they're frozen. They're fro the spins are kind of frozen in random directions, but they're frozen. And that's going to give you a non-zero uh, function there. So that, that works out pretty well. Um, it gets weird, though, uh, because for the sharing to Kirkpatrick uh, spin glass, which is all to all, um, you actually have a, uh, an overlap that actually is non-zero between exact copies of the system. Okay, so I have to introduce some uh, indices, alpha and beta. Alpha uh, and beta and gamma and like, you know, uh, any number of these things relate to exact copies of the exact same system. So if I take a, a spin glass, the same JIJ coupling matrix, and same in initial conditions, for a spin glass, it actually won't necessarily give me the same time average spin configuration between alpha and beta. And at first that sounds ridiculous, but you have to realize that there's always going to be some fluctuations. There's temperature, um, there's uh, quantum fluctuations if you're at temperature equals zero. There are always going to be some fluctuations. And because the free energy landscape is so rugged, even those small fluctuations are enough to drive the system, can be enough to drive the system into completely different valleys in that alpine landscape. And those different valleys, once you're there, you're stuck. And if you take the spin configurations in different valleys, on average, they won't look the same. Okay, so if you tend to take their overlap in different valleys or different copies of the system prepared in different valleys, naturally through fluctuations, you actually won't get, you won't get zero, and you, but you won't also get like, you know, the maximum number of this, which is unity either. You'll get something in the middle. So that's called the replica spin overlap function. And it's the, the very bizarre thing. Uh, the fact that it's non-zero is called replica symmetry breaking, meaning that if I create exact cop copies of replicas, I won't get exactly the same um, outcome if I cool them down or go through a quantum uh, uh, spin uh, transition. So that's called replica symmetry breaking. So um, in my experiment, instead of uh, going down in temperature, because we have this driven distributed system, it's kind of weird to think what temperature actually means in the system. Um, we actually go through uh, what's called a transverse uh, Ising transition. Um, and technically, it's called a superating Hepley Dickey transition. Okay? 
never mind exactly what that means. Uh, but we have the, the first part here, which is that friendly looking, the usual um, icing transition. Ours is actually XY, I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. But we have a, a transverse term, which, has, is, uh, which wants to point the spins in a different direction. And the, the coefficient of that is inversely proportional to the pump power. So as we pump the system harder, we change the, the relative uh, strength of these two terms, which allows us to go down in this axis here, which I'm drawing out of the board, from a ferromagnetic transition or a uh, paramagnetic transition, depending on exactly where I am, uh, into the spin glass. Okay, so that's what we'll be doing here. Okay, so that sets the stage. Let me dive down a little bit more into this whole replica business and uh, go back to the overlaps. So, um, you know, until we had experiments that could actually make replicas, all we had were computers, right? So what I could do is take a computer and I could program it to emulate this, uh, this Hamiltonian, this, this spin glass Hamiltonian, uh, starting from the same JIJ matrix and the same, sorry, the same JIJ matrix and the same initial conditions and, you know, seed it with some stochastic noise to, um, to represent thermal or, or uh, quantum fluctuations. And I can run it many, many times, okay? So as many times as I like. So if I had a JIJ matrix, uh, I keep pointing over there because I think that's Hamilton. Uh, say I have a JIJ matrix that's all positive, so it's all a ferromagnet. What I would get is that um, uh, some of the minima would be both positive, uh, both all spin up. And you know, if I take the overlap of both spin up, I get a positive overlap with 50% uh, probability if they're all, and, and combined with them all being uh, down. So negative, negative, is a positive, and so I get uh, another overlap that's, that's positive here. If I get uh, one a replica that is, say, positive, and one replica that is negative, so all spin up and all spin down, then a product of those is a minus sign, so I get these kind of two spikes at the um, bordering the, the, the overlap distribution here, uh, with 50% probability for each. Um, these are uh, lovingly called the goalposts, and uh, it'll become evident why. So you'll get these goalposts for a ferromagnet. That's the distribution that you get. Um, if I have a spin glass, however, um, I'll get the goalposts again uh, because some of them will be exactly the same configuration uh, and some of them will be the same up to a minus sign. That's the spin inversion symmetry. Um, but I can also, uh, because I could uh, run the system and settle into a replica that's in a different valley, say B, um, I could get an overlap between the state in A and state of the B that um, is not actually all that large. Like the spin configurations um, have a lot of the spins that are flipped, but some of them are the same. So when I take this, this product here and average over, I get a non-zero number, but it's small. So I get a non-zero number, but it's small, and the probability of doing that is like, is lower. It's like, you know, maybe 15% rather than 50%, okay? Um, and of course, I get the symmetry uh, reflected uh, uh, counterpart as well. So um, you could do that again. So say I have another spin glass J, so a different JIJ matrix, uh, and I do it, and I, and I get some more peaks. And generally, in the thermodynamic limit, these spikes will be sparse, so they won't be everywhere. There'll be a few of them that have, the few valleys will have some overlaps that are similar, but most of them don't have any overlap whatsoever. The spin configurations are very different. So this is what I'll get. So this is uh, great, um, that's neat. It's not really a great thermodynamic quantity because it is microscopically dependent on the particular J that we have, which is, uh, depends on the microscopic disorder. And generally, when we talk about statistical mechanics, we don't want to have to deal with anything that has to do with microscopics. Like, we want to just average over all of that. And so what Parisi did, one of his great insights, was say, well, what you really, and not the only one, and maybe even the minor one, uh, but an important one, uh, is that uh, you take an average over all possible disorder realizations of the J, and then average over that. And when you do that, okay, I illustrated this, but you get the idea. Uh, when you do that, you get this, um, you get the goal post with the goal net, the soccer net between them, okay? So this is called the Precy order parameter. And this is actually the order parameter, the second order parameter for a spin glass, uh, at least a Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass. And it's debatable whether short range spin glasses uh, also have this. So you average over all that and you get this distribution like so. And this is a good thermodynamic quantity. Okay, so how do we realize that in our system? Um, in our system, uh, our effective Hamiltonian does not look like a simple uh, icing type system. It looks like GIJ times this cosine of the, those angles between those density waves, or which we're calling these XY spins, 
Uh, you can actually rewrite this to something that looks like an XY, an, an, an anisotropic XY Hamiltonian, like so, with some other small terms like this. Um, and this is the, that coupling matrix. So this is what we're dealing with with our Hamiltonian. Um, we now have, again, two order parameters. We have uh, the magnetization, the N, which is vector, and we have a matrix overlap. Uh, for a paramagnet, what these look like are the following. The magnetization now can be in X and, and in Y. And for a paramagnet, you know, at a, at a finite temperature, it's mostly around zero. If we look at the overlap, uh, because it's vector, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we actually have to take these combinations of uh, QXX and QYY, or QXX minus QYY, and we can plot it in this 2D plot. And for a paramagnet, this is also close to zero. Now I'm going to show you some experimental data about what this looks like for our system. Uh, so if we go now to the next uh, 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 kind of uh, state, the ferromagnet, and we run the experiment uh, with a JJ matrix that's all positive or, or equivalent to an all positive JJ matrix, then the light that comes out in the hologram is all blue. Okay, so it means that the spins are more or less pointed to the right like so. So this is a, what we call an X ferromagnet. And um, if we look at the magnetization, uh, we see that it's plus or minus X. Okay, that's exactly what we would Imagine we can't really distinguish the plots uh, all going left and all going right, so we symmetrize it. We have half going left and half going right. And the spin overlap here is also not at zero. It's uh, kind of concentrated uh, at the goalpost. So this is the 2D version of this 1D goalpost picture like so. Okay, so that checks out. Um, if you look at the energy configuration, so we run this many, many times, hundreds of times, and look at the energy, plug in these, these vectors into the Hamiltonian and calculate the energy, you get this nice Maxwell-Boltzmann looking di distribution with a, a T over TC that's about a tenth. So that's great. It means that we've, this driven dissipative system is not so quote unquote hot that you're in the paramagnetic regime, which of course you knew from this. Um, it's about a tenth of TC. So that's, that's something we didn't know. Like we can actually do it and it can be cold enough despite going through this driven dissipative uh, superheated transition. And we can change the JIJ matrix so that we have a Y ferromagnet. We get the same sort of analogous thing in the Y direction, uh, and we get uh, roughly the same kind of temperature. So again, this is a benchmark experiment. Um, now let's go on to the spin glass. All right, so now let's move with our tweezers, let's move these little clumps of atoms in such a way that we get a disordered and random side J, okay? And one particular one, all right? So if we take a snapshot of that, we run the system, we go through that transition, and we see the light that comes out of the cavity, uh, sometimes we get this twister mat, okay? So we get this configuration. Uh, these all are more or less different colors, well, almost different colors. We do it again. Uh, we, we like, you know, uh, drop the atoms, recreate the, 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 the BCs, split them up again, run the system again, but keep them in the exact same position within a micron. We run it again, and we get this replica. Okay, so this is it. Everything's the same, except now we get a different configuration. When we do it a third time, we get a different configuration. When we do it a fourth time, we get uh, a different one still. Although this one, no, these two are the same. Yeah. Uh, no, they're not the same. <laughs> Sorry, I stared at a lot of these. Um, so sometimes you get the same, all right, and sometimes you get different ones. That's exactly what you would expect. Okay? And so if you take like hundreds of these and you then take this overlap between all of those, it takes some time in the laboratory to do this, and you take the overlap of all those and you plot them on that spin, the 2D spin overlap diagram, you get something that looks structured. It's kind of like the same thing, this is the projection down and just to this axis, kind of like what you would expect for a spin glass overlap function. You get some sparse peaks, they're broadened because it's some finite temperature or finite size, and so it's a little bit broadened. But you get these little spikes, and these are the self-overlaps over here. In 2Ds, you get this structure. And each one of these, these main peaks here, and their symmetry reflections, you can correspond to these different replicas here if you go back to the data and work out. Like this one is mostly due to the overlap between one and four. This one is between one and three, and so forth. And there's some other ones that you know, are just a mixture of stuff. Okay, so that's, that's our experimental evidence for spin glass order. But we can do more, okay? So let's, let's do some more. Um, so let's look at that pre -C order parameter, the pre -C distribution. So what we're gonna do is um, change the positions of the atoms. So we just did 100 shots with the atoms in the same position each time. But now we're gonna do 100 shots 
with them in a slightly different position that realizes a different JIJ coupling matrix, okay? Um, and then uh, we're gonna measure the, the overlap distribution for that one, taking 100 replicas for each one of those Js, rinse and repeat, and do it 123 times, okay? So that's a lot of data, right? So we just crank through all that data. And if you stare at this, you see like, you know, these are not all the same. Some of them look similar, but some of them look very, very different. Um, and yeah, I've stared at this a lot. <laughs> so. But if you take all this and average it together, you get the Parisi distribution. And this is our experimental Parisi distribution for our system. So you get these gold posts here, okay, so um, you get some stripe stuff, which we believe is due to the fact that we have only eight XY spins. So there's some finite size effects, which is kind of like the stripiness a little bit, although it's not completely explained by that, but that's um, what we think. And this is the analog of this two-dimensional one. Of course, this is in like the thermodynamic limit, you know, the huge system size would be completely smooth. This is definitely not in the huge size limit. But you still see some structure of some spikes at the ends, the goalposts, and something um, lighter in the middle. Um, and then, you know, just to, be, you know, double check that you have a glass, right? Um, you know, the magnetization should be zero, and this is the experimental magnetization from these. Okay, so it's close to zero, broadened by finite size and effective temperature effects. So this is what we claim is a new type of vector spin glass made of atoms and photons. Um, let's do some theory experiment comparison, let's try. Um, so we did, uh, and there's really no good theory for this. This is a non-equilibrium quantum optical system. There's not, there, isn't, there isn't a theory package off the shelf that we can run and, and do this sort of thing. So we kind of cooked up the best thing we could do using parallel temporary Monte Carlo, uh, simulated in you know, rapid simulated annealing. And uh, what we get are, you know, these are some four examples. So these are four different spin overlaps. There's four of those big matrix I just showed on, on the previous slide. This is the one I showed you on the two slides ago. Um, sometimes they look similar sort of similar, similar, and sometimes they're just completely different. <laughs> and we don't know why. Um, you know, the broadening is, is kind of similar, so you can change how you do this in order to make it broader or lighter, depending, on you know, washing it out due to, uh, like, effective temperature effects. But this is the best we can do, so it's clear that we needed to do more work. If you average all the theory together, you get, uh, you get this, and this is the experiment. Oh, uh, I think I swapped these, sorry. Uh, Okay, that was a mistake. Um, yeah, so swap these two. Um, you can see that you know there's some similarities. Uh, swap these two labels. Um, there's some similarities, but they're not the same. Um, and then and magnetization looks a lot more similar, but that's a very simple, simple measure. So the upshot of all of this is that uh, we need to do more theory for this um, driven dissipative quantum optical system. It's not totally off base, uh, but it's clear that we're doing something that looks like a spin glass. I don't have time, but we have some data where we ramp through the transition at different rates, and we can see uh, how the glass goes from something that looks more paramagnetic to something that looks more, more glassy, but I won't take time to explain that and just move to my last slide, um, which is one of the future directions we want to go into. So of course we want to study dynamics of the system, do dynamic susceptibility, aging type experiments, but also we can turn this into something that uh, looks like associated memory. So one of those applications that uh, we talked about on one of the earlier slides, we can actually do that with our quantum optical system where um, we, we shape the uh, free energy landscape realized by the spin network to represent a special kind of pattern. So if you take the, this alpine landscape and, and, and encode like you know, this valley here is like rubidium, uh, you know, the picture of rubidium and like zeros and, zeros and ones or spins up and down or, or some XY spin, and this one is, say, dysprosium, which is the greatest atom on Earth, um, then, uh, then you know, if you actually try to put into the system some disordered uh, version of that some, with some mistakes, then the dynamics of the system actually roll down back into the, the correct version. And we found in, in, a, in a paper here that this happens very efficiently. You actually realize deepest descent dynamics due to the dissipation uh, in the quantum optical system, which you don't with, like, um, metropolis hastings or Glauber dynamics. So that's really neat. You actually get, that increases your me memory capacity and fidelity. So, um, so what we like to do is like, you know, use these energy minima, stored patterns, to store, you know, uh, a pretty image and, a, and a, you know, another image. Um, 
put in a corrupted in, uh, input, and then lo and behold, you get the right image. Uh, oh, oh, wait, yeah, okay, you get the right image. Uh, again, and do this and see like what kind of capacity, how many images can we simultaneously store? It's known theoretically how many you should be able to do. It's 0.14 times the number of spins you have, uh, number of sites you have in the network. If we can exceed that, we can show this quantum optical network as we predicted here, actually has some interesting dynamical features that, that help you to store memory. Okay, so with that, I will again show you the people who do the real work um, and just advertise uh, two other uh, results in our group. Using the same system, we made uh, an optical lattice that vibrates, that has phonons, that has sound. The speed of sound is like a, a tortoise, so okay, whatever. <laughs> but uh, it can vibrate. Um, and then in a completely different apparatus, uh, using dysprosium, uh, we've created a, um, a quantum version of an Archimedes screw, uh, or a topological pump, uh, using a 1D, uh, 1D dipolar gas and created what are called quantum antibody scar states in that gas. And then most recently, squeezed the heck out of them in a quench and found weird behavior in the momentum distributions that uh, arise when the gas is being squeezed. So I encourage you to check that out. And thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Ben, for a great talk. Questions from the audience, particularly about dysprosium and it's being the best atom. Help. If I have an ideal degenerate cavity with some finite cutoff, then I could get a mode that has an electric field of waste, because you know, the coupling depends on the, the waste of the mode, that is as small as the atoms, and so the electric field is really huge. And so it's a lot larger than like, the peak of the Gaussian of that, because you know, the constructive interference of all the modes. This particular case, it's not as simple as that, because the modes aren't perfectly degenerate, and so this definition only works in the dispersive limit, but the idea holds. There are some connections. Um, I, I would say the main difference is that this has a very clear quantum mechanical limit. And those Ising machines, those are usually using, uh, representing uh, ups and downs as uh, bosonic mean fields. And so uh, below the threshold of the transition, those are in the vacuum state. And then, they, then you get like either zero pi or up or down. Here, you're dealing with spins, at least in the, uh, in the quant quantum spin limit that are always there. So in below threshold, they're you know, in a paramagnet state, but they're always pointing somewhere. And so when you're optimizing with the coherent IC machine, you go in the, the hypercube of spin configuration space, you go from the center out to the edge and then search around the edge, which goes through a lot of saddle points, which is not maybe so effective. Whereas here, you're always on the surface of that hypercube of configuration space, uh, which maybe means that you go through uh, fewer um, saddle points as you're optimizing. But I'm not claiming that either one is actually good for that kind of optimization. Ehud. These are not thermal expectation values, these are just time averages. Um, that's all you need, uh, so A. Uh, B, um, yeah, I mean, we wait for a, a quote unquote steady state, which is maybe more like a pre-thermal state. So these are, you, you act, they're not defined with respect to a thermal average because that's kind of strangely defined in these systems. 
Yeah, the time average, yeah. So there is a question about what the dynamics of these things are. That's kind of our next experiment. But when we do take those time average, those snapshots, we've waited long enough that the spin configurations aren't changing very much from moment to moment. That's the best we can do. We'd like to wait longer and see what happens. Okay, additional questions? One, two, three. Yeah, okay, so, right, so what happens really is that the spins are, are down, or, you know, uh, and, then, and then as we pump harder, they go through this super radiant phase transition, they go into the XY plane, so this is negative Z. You go in the XY plane, and they order somewhere in, in that XY phase. Um, and then uh, we wait some amount of time, and at some point, if we wait too long, this, the system is heating up, because it's constantly scattering photons for, for spontaneous emission, or from parametric heating because the lattice itself generated inside the cavity is shaking and giving you par parametric ex excitation. Either way, it all goes to hell at some point. Uh, we can't really see what's happening. Um, we have, we've improved the system so we can see many more factors in time scale. And we have a technique which uh, we have demonstrated which gives us like stroboscopic measurements along that. And that's what we're doing right now is to see, okay, right below threshold, right at threshold, right after, some amount of time after, some even longer time after, what is the evolution of that? And that's really interesting. I don't know the answer yet, but that will also tell us how this associated memory organizes into these, these minima, like dysprosium or rubidium or Stanford. Do you have a sense from like any of the, the theory that you can do, like how the, the time scale that you can put over compared to like some of the like Uh, not from numerical simulation like parallel temporane or some sort of like uh, fast uh, simulating alien. Like they just, they're not getting this problem right at all and we don't really know the right way to do it. And with single spins, we've developed a lot of quantum trajectory hardware to do this and we can do it really well for single spins and even get entanglement measures. That's that preprint. But for what we have now, it kind of falls in the cracks, like maybe some cumulant method would work. But just going to like a simple back of the envelope, the J, the maximum J here is about eight kilohertz, uh, two pi times that. So we can wait about a factor of 10 or 20 longer than that uh, in our observation before we don't quite trust things yet or when we're extending that. So we get an order of magnitude or more uh, separation in time scales. So it's kind of the best we can do right now. I think there's somebody behind you. Yeah. No, you, yeah. Oh, you. yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is like a transverse icing, it's actually transverse XY transition. Um, I don't know whether it's fast or slow, but you know, at the transition it takes tens of microseconds, hundreds, 100 or two microseconds to happen, and that's like several fac factors uh, slower than uh, one over J, the maximal J. Okay, good. So we're a quarter past. I see lots of good hands still up, so I encourage everyone to come up and speak to Professor Lev afterwards. And with that, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.